Hey everybody, Austin Meyer here, and today we are going to discover how jet engines work. Now, here's the thing. I've looked at all the same YouTube videos you probably have, listened to jet pilots, and they all say the same thing. The air comes in, the front of the engine, it gets compressed, fuel is added, that adds energy, and then that compressed air shoots out the back of the engine, and the equal and opposite reaction is to push the airplane forwards. Yes, 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 I know, I know, I know. We've all heard it a million times. But if you actually just accept that explanation at face value, you will see that there are a lot of unanswered questions that caused this whole explanation to not make a whole lot of sense. I got the questions written down behind me and let's kind of dig into each of the three of those. The first question I wanna ask is as follows. They, they say that the air is pressurized, right? They say they pressurize the air in the middle of that jet engine, compressing all that air in. Well, here's the part I don't get. If you compress that air in the middle of a jet engine, why does it only expand out the back? If you told me to build a jet engine, yeah, I'm sure I could find a way to pump some air in there, add some fuel, the fuel would heat the air up and it would expand. But in my jet engine, the air would expand in all directions. It would come out the front of the engine and the back of the engine. The airplane wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> so, let me specify the question as precisely as I can. Air pressure pushes in all directions equally. So why, with a jet engine, does the pressurized air only go out the back? <laughs> well, the first thing we need to do in cases like this is always the same thing. We need to collect the data. Now there's a place in St. Martin's, which is uh, a big resort down near the equator, where you can actually get close enough to airliners operating at full thrust to collect the data yourself. Now, I'm too lazy to go down there myself though, so I sent Thompson Meeks my director of social media to go down there on my behalf and take some measurements. Thompson, how you doing? Hey, it's going great. Yeah, it's about 90 degrees down here, a few clouds, 30 Celsius for the Europeans. And if you look over there, there's a giant A350 that's about to take off. And when it does, I'm gonna get some wind readings on this anemometer so that uh, you can put the data into X-Plane and we can make it even better. Awesome! Now, I see there's signs all over the place saying things like, warning, jet blast, danger. Are you concerned at all for your safety? Oh, those signs about the jet blast? Well, you see cruise ships come here, so there are a lot of tourists. So you just have to put that up for safety and liability and stuff, but it's fine. You said it's only gonna be like, what, 20 knots? Uh, yeah, but I actually didn't know you'd be that close to the airliners. Oh, it'll be fine. No big deal. I got my anemometer. Oops, looks like Thompson got a little wet. Oh well, that's fine. It doesn't matter because I actually already figured out the answer on my own by researching it. So what we have here is a side view of a jet engine. Here, let me show you one in 3D so you see what I mean. Yeah, there it is. So here's a side view of it, okay? So in the side view of the jet engine, you see the air comes in here, it gets compressed, compressed, compressed by these compressors, fuel is added, and then the air escapes out through the turbines uh, and out the back of the engine. Now here's the really cool thing about this that is so like low tech steampunk. This whole thing that I'm touching here, the red, the gray, and the green, that's just all one big part. Literally, it's just one big piece of metal, or maybe the, the blades are welded in or something. But this is one big piece of metal that all spins together. Here it is in 3D. So the question remains, why is it the air only goes out the turbines? It only goes out the back, not out the front. And here's where this answer is just so obvious. <laughs> in hindsight, everything is obvious, isn't it? There's not very many turbines. There's a whole lot of compressor stages. There's not very many turbine stages. In fact, sometimes there's only one turbine stage. And since there's not very many of them, clearly, whoop, the air is gonna escape via the path of least resistance. If I have to run through 100 gates or run through 10 gates, I'll run through the smaller number of gates to get out of the pasture. So 
Think of, think of it here from the air's perspective. If you've got high pressure air in here that'll want to get out any way it can, it's going to go out through the path of least resistance. Put simply, these turbines are leaky. They're leaky turbines. It's easier for the air to get out the back than out the front because there's fewer turbines. So it's just leaky in the back. The air gets out the back. Um, now let me look at this in a slightly more technical way. What we have here is the pressure in blue, okay? And you can see numbers over here if you want. But as the air hits the compressors, it's boop, 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 pressurized up. Then it holds a constant pressure here inside the burner. Yeah, it's a high pressure, but it doesn't change across the burner because there's nothing in the burner that would limit pressure. Then when it hits the turbine, the pressure drops. Now let's imagine your air for a moment. You're in here, you're trying to find the easiest way out of here under this high pressure. Are you gonna jump forward of this little turbine, which will only lower the pressure this much? Or are you gonna jump out through this little turbine, which will reduce the pressure that much? Well, nature abhors a vacuum. High pressure air wants to go to wherever the pressure is lowest. So, or out the air goes, out the back. It's almost like the air is being sucked out the back when you think about it. The air is gonna race through that 60 PSI pressure differential and go from the high pressure to the low pressure. It's what air does. So you can actually look at it as saying, air is sucked out of the back of the jet engine. The turbines are leakier. Kind of simple when you think about it. Now, there's a problem though with my leaky turbine theory, and that's when we come to the next question. How do these dinky, leaky little turbines drive these big, bad compressors? Remember, air is rapidly allowed to escape. It's clearly gonna come out up here with a lot of energy still on board. So how do you get enough power to spin all these like 10 compressor stages with just a couple of turbines? Well, the first thing I always like to do in cases like this is come up with the data. Oops, looks like Thompson died. Oh well, that's fine. It doesn't matter because I've already figured it out on my own. And here's the answer. Do you guys remember from high school, the old equation power equals force times velocity? Let's visualize that. Let's say you're in a, uh, a car that's run out of gas. <laughs> gas. My Tesla can't run out of gas. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just trolling, just trolling. I'm addicted to trolling. Okay, let's say you're in a gas burning car and you're out of gas. And so now you have to push your car since it's out of gas. Uh, Sorry, I have a problem with trolling. But okay, you're pushing your, your gas burning car. And let's say you're having to push the car twice as hard. Well, if you're pushing the car twice as hard, then you gotta, you're got you putting out twice the power. But here's where it gets interesting. Let's say you're not pushing your car any harder, but you're pushing it faster. You're pushing faster. It's still twice the power. If you're pushing the car twice as fast, that's twice the power that your body is having to put out to push that car. Let's take a look at what happens to the air inside this combustor. The air is compressed, it comes in, and I drew all the little air molecules here. It's all tightly you know, pushed together in orange. Then the flame is added. Now, the flame is adding energy. Everyone can agree to that. The flame's adding energy to the flow, but how? Is the flame adding heat? Yeah. Is the heat driving the turbine? No. If you take this turbine out of the engine, put it in my oven and heat it to 400 degrees, it's not gonna suddenly start spinning. Heat doesn't make a turbine turn. So you add all the heat you want, it's not gonna spin a turbine. What about pressure? Maybe you say, oh yeah, but it's more pressure. That's what spins a turbine. Nope, not true. Look at the pressure. The pressure doesn't really change across the turbine or across the uh, combustion chamber. If anything, you lose pressure just due to the friction of the, of the walls and whatnot. Remember, when you add fire into the middle of this thing, that pressure goes in all directions equally. However much pressure you add from fire is gonna push forward against the compressor just as much as it's gonna push back against the turbine at the back of the engine. The pressure is not increased by the fire <laughs> over the turbine.
because the pressure is increased every direction equally. And so how is it the turbine picks up power from the flame? How does it happen? And as the air is moving through, sucked out the back and moves through the fire, at some point this, it hits the fire, the temperature is gonna skyrocket. And when the temperature skyrockets, those molecules are going to spread out. For a given, temp, for a given pressure at a higher temperature, the molecules are they're gonna spread out like this. And when they spread out, what are they gonna do? They're gonna speed up. The molecules are expanding away from each other thanks to the temperature of this flame. As they expand away from each other, what do they do? They race out the back faster. So the airflow over the turbine is faster than the airflow coming in from the compressor. Power equals force times velocity. We have the same force on each of these. The force on this turbine is the same as the force on this one back here. The compressor and the turbine, they have equal force. The force is the same. Force is the pressure. But they don't have the same velocity. There's much higher velocity back here at the turbine. And since power equals force times velocity, there's more power. That's how this leaky, small, dinky little turbine can still come up with enough power to drive the much bigger, heavier duty compressor. It's the fact that the air is going faster. And since power equals force times velocity, there's more power, more power available for the turbine. This is a no bypass jet engine. This looks like the engine maybe an F4 Phantom or something like that. It's just one simple turbojet. But the thing is modern jet engines, they have two different RPMs. So there's a big fan up front that turns at a different speed. You ever notice that the modern jet engines have the big, huge fan up in the front of the engine and it turns at a different speed than the little turbine. You know, you've got the N1 and the N2. Anybody that flies an airliner or sees, sees airliner uh, engine instruments sees there's an N1 and an N2 in the cockpit. One part of the engine seems to drive the other in some way. Uh, it's like this N2 here, see this is the N2 basically, the N2 seems to drive the N1, which is a big fan. But how? Well, in cases like this, the first thing I want to do is collect the data. Thompson is dead, so I'm going to go do it myself this time. Okay, I'm back from standing behind jet engines and I now have the answer as to how the N2 drives the N1. And the answer is windmills. Here's what I mean by that. What if you put another turbine in the exhaust and hook that turbine up through another shaft to a gigantic fan up front? Well, that's exactly what they do with the modern engine. This thing here is this thing here. The fuel is all burned here in the N2 shaft, but exhaust shoots out of the back of this turbine into a bigger turbine. And that turbine is hooked up to the shaft up front. And what's so interesting about this is there's no gears, there's no welding, there's no connection. These two shafts spin completely independently, but the exhaust popping out of the back of the N2 is what drives the N1. And that is how it is that the N2 shaft, where all the fuel is burned, spins the N1 shaft where most of the thrust is actually made. And that's why when you advance power, first the temperature comes up, that's something in the fuel, then the N2 comes up, that starts spinning up the N2, then the N1 comes up after that. The exhaust popping out of this N2, then eventually drives N1. So those are the three questions that I wanted to answer about jet engines. And despite how crazy I look right now, <laughs> I think I got the answers to those questions figured out.